want to point out that there's going to be a change in the order of services. This has been voted on by the Board of Elders and the order of service will begin like this. The pastor will say, the Lord be with you. And the congregation will say, and with your spirit. And the pastor will say, will everyone please turn on their tablet, PC, iPad, smartphone, and Kindle Bibles to 1 Corinthians 13.13. 13. And please switch on your Bluetooth to download the sermon. And after that, now let us pray, committing this week into God's hands. Open your apps, BBM, Twitter, and Facebook, and chat with God. And as we take our Sunday tithes and offerings, please have your credit and debit cards ready. You can log on to the church Wi-Fi using the password LORD909887. The ushers will circulate mobile card swipe machines among the worshipers. Those who prefer to take the electronic fund transfers are directed to computers and laptops at the rear of the church. Those who prefer to use iPads can open them. Those who prefer telephone banking take out your cell phones and transfer your contributions to the church account. The holy atmosphere of Trinity Bible Church becomes truly electrified as all of the smartphones, iPads, PCs, laptops beep and flicker. There comes the final blessing and announcements. This week's ministry cell meetings will be held on various Facebook group pages where the usual group chatting takes place. Please log in and don't miss out. Thursday's catechism study will be held live on Skype at 1900 hours GMT. Please don't miss out. You can follow your pastor on Twitter this weekend for counseling and prayers. God bless you and have a nice day. Isn't that neat? <laughs> And then, of course, the last thing on it said, Jesus wept. <laughs> For something perhaps a little more serious, we invite your attention to Luke chapter 12 as we continue our series on some of the parables of our Lord. Now, the important thing about the parables is that it gives you something of a summary statement of what kingdom living is all about. It gives to us a presentation of how it begins and how it ends. It gives to us a presentation of who the true disciples and followers of Christ are and who they are not. There will be setbacks along the way, but in the end, the kingdom of God wins through and through. Luke chapter 12, let's begin with verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who appointed me a judge or arbiter over you? Then he said to them, Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed, for not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man was very productive. And he began to reason to himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your soul is required of you. And now who will own what you have prepared? So it is with the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. As we give some thought to this parable, I'm reminded of the early years when I was still in seminary and Alice and I were not even married but a few months. And I worked in the home office of Pacific Finance in the mail room. And there was another young man there who wasn't a Christian and some of us were and he would always come up to us and he would say something along these lines is heaven if heaven is such a great place how come God hasn't taken you there and so we had listened to that for a while and we all finally came up with one answer he keeps us around for people like you and so the discussion and sometimes the argument would go but there came a time when that young man came to know Christ as his savior and we need to keep in mind who we are we need to keep in mind the importance of our presence on the face of the earth. Remember in the Olivet Discourse, 
Jesus basically said, if it weren't for the sake of the elect, the whole world would be destroyed. And remember who we are once again, that we are a holy nation to dwell among the nations, to speak of the majesty and the excellency of God. We don't gather together on Sundays as a hideout from reality. And so we're advised to know the value of our lives, to be certain of our priorities, and to know that our commitment is true. And so we want to consider the life of a successful fool. We certainly want to see his thoughts and what he had to say to himself, an interesting conversation. But as we look at him, we want to notice that he was wealthy. We want to notice that he was a thinker, he was a planner. But notice in the end, he totally failed, and his failure was all of his own doing. He thwarted his own success. So let's take a look at this wealth that he had. He was a wealthy man, and as we look a little more closely, we see he was a man of property as well as prosperity. In Luke 12, verse 16, And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man was very productive. Notice that here is the very foundation and the source of his wealth. It's interesting, of course, that the farm would be the picture because agriculture was so important then, even as it is now. And you sometimes wonder, years ago when my dad was on the road with, with Samsonite luggage, he had all of Kansas, eastern Colorado, and part of Nebraska for his territory, and in the summertime I'd get to ride along. And I'll never forget the beautiful sight of being in Kansas at the time of harvest. As far as you could see, there was this wheat field. There was a breeze gently blowing, and the wheat was just kind of waving like a flag. And it was really beautiful, and of course, being a snob from Colorado, I thought that was the only beautiful thing there in Kansas. But there was wealth there. And the people were excited about the harvest time. And I wonder if this isn't a part of the picture that we see. For notice the property was highly productive. He didn't have to own billions of acres to eke out a living. He had some property that was productive. And he took advantage of it because he was a man of prosperity. Notice, and he said, and he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man was very productive. And we emphasize the fact that he is a rich man. His wealth was tied to the soil. And he was obviously a good businessman as well as a good farmer. And he had a successful track record. For notice what we see here in verse 12 or verse 18 rather, then he said, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. This was not a poor farmer by any stretch of the imagination, but he could see the future and the future looked good to him. So he was going to build on his track record. He was not going to squander the opportunities that he saw before him. He's going to tear down the barns and build larger ones and store all of this grain and all of the goods that made him a wealthy man. Notice that as being a wealthy man, as we have seen, he was a planner. And he stated his problem, he formulated his plan, and he articulated his purpose. Notice in verse 17, And he began reasoning to himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no place to store my crops? He anticipates greater harvests. He can see it. He can feel it. He can taste it. He can live it. And he anticipates shortage. And so he's going to solve the problem. And then he said, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all of my grains. Notice how that he works. I'm going to do this in order to do that. And in order to do that, this also is what I must do. He formulated a plan. He was not one who would shoot from the hip. He was one who would think things through. He would reason with himself. And he would build larger barns so that he could care for and not lose the increased wealth. And he will suffer no loss due to defective planning. 
And so he articulated his purpose. And now we see the end goal as it comes to mind. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be married. He's provided a good life for himself and probably for his wife and for his children and maybe even others who is part of the family. But now he's going to enter into that good life. I've heard people say there's no such thing as retirement in the Christian life. Well, that may be true, but there was retirement in the eyes and the mind of this farmer. I've got many years of assets built up. I don't have to work anymore. I'm just going to sit back and I'm going to say to my soul, take your ease, eat, drink, be merry. And notice that he had no thought for the future that would go beyond what he had prepared. In terms of business, he was good. In terms of planning, he was good. In terms of knowing what he was going to do with his life, he was good. Many of the counselors would say, sorrowful is the life of the person who is basically committed only to his work. Here is a man who saw his work as a means to an end. And that was a beautiful end as far as he could tell. And I don't know that what we see here is much different than what we would find in Europe or in the United States. But he was indeed wealthy, and it had to do with the fact that he was a good planner. But notice in the end, not only did he fail, but he totally failed. Why? Because he was a fool. Why? Because his life was taken from him and he had no control over that. And in the end, all of his plans were frustrated. And we need to keep this very much in view for ourselves as well. Let's look at this a little more closely. He totally failed. In verse 20, But God said to him, You fool, this very night your soul is required of you, and now who will own what you have prepared? You might be a well-known person in the Chamber of Commerce in your community. You might belong to one of the civic clubs to help things along. But because you have left me out of your life, you are a fool. He certainly was the wise farmer, as we have said. He's the wise businessman, as we have said. But he was still a fool. And it's important that we can keep in mind that you can still be a wise, prosperous businessman and in the end, still be a fool. Now, why then is he a fool? We see it and notice that this would be basic reasoning for those in the time of the Lord and where he was. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They're corrupt. They have committed abominable deeds. There is no one who does good. Strong thinking, strong statement, but nevertheless true when God is left out of the life. In that same time, when I worked at the home base, we had some elderly gentleman, and he was working there, had been for a long time. He had taken so many different units in college that if he put them all together under one major, he probably would have had a PhD. He just loved to go to school. Didn't care about the degree, just cared about the learning. And so every so often we would gig him and say, you know what, you've got a lot of education behind you, but it's the fool who says in his heart there is no God. He would really get mad at us and he said, and I know plenty of fools who believe in God too. Well, we'll have to talk about the difference between the two kinds of fools. How must we not do this? Yes, we should. And why then is he the fool? Because he left God out of his life. He left God out of the foundation. He left God out of the purpose and the intent for what it means to be a living human being. And notice that the denial prohibits one to make God the top priority in his life. So is the man who stores up treasure for himself, and he is not rich toward God. Not everybody can become financially wealthy, but everybody can become spiritually wealthy. And in the end, the material of the time will either be removed from us or we will be removed from the material goods of life. But in either case, it is the life of the fool who builds some thought of eternity upon what can only exist in time. And so notice we see, so is the man 
who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. We live in a rather well-to-do community. And the question that we need to bring to our neighbors is, are you wealthy toward God? What is your bank account with God? What is the strength of your faith in God? Is Jesus Christ the object of your faith? There is where the wealth is. And so we then see that his life was taken from him. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your soul is required of you. Let's not overlook that because in the end we are reminded that we are not the captain of our own fate. We are reminded that we were created in the image of God. We are reminded that we are to reflect accurately and with faith and love that image. And when we finally say, I am free to be whatever I want to be, and particularly in postmodern times in which we live, when for one reason or another I can create myself at 9 o'clock in the morning, take a look at myself at 10 and said that didn't go too well, so I'm going to dump all of that and I'm going to create a new self. And by the time it's ready, I'm ready for bed, I could have created a new self eight, nine, 10, 11 times, depending on two things, how dissatisfied I am and how creative I am, and that's all that it takes. But there's nothing lasting there. And what we need to know, that it's in God that we live, that we move, that we have our very existence, that it's from God that we have every good and perfect gift, and there is not one thing that we have but what it has not been given to us, either by his providential care or by his redemptive care. We are not our own, and we owe him the glory and the thanks. And this is what this man did. He left God out of the, out of the equa equation altogether. And how many people either deliberately or non-deliberately leave God out? It's hard to think of how it could be non-deliberated, but nevertheless, there are those who don't think about it whatsoever anymore. Your soul is required of you. He assumed that he owned his own life. He assumed that he owned his own future. He assumed that he could control the future, and he refused to recognize that God had a prior and legitimate claim over both of these things. And notice that his plans were frustrated. But God said to him, you fool, this very night, your soul is required of you. And now, who will own that you have prepared? This is what I am going to do. The only thing that he really knew that he could do was what he had planned. He had no guarantee that those plans would ever be activated and have them materialize. Notice what he said. This is what I am going to do. I'm going to make a transition from the present. I'm going to tear down my barns. I'm going to build bigger ones. I'm going to store it all up. And I'm going to have enough to last me for years ahead. And I'm going to say, down, say soul, let's sit down together. Let's eat, drink, and be merry. And not one thought about tomorrow you may die. Not in this scenario. But notice that he had to give account to God for his life as it was lived. He had to forfeit his holdings. All of his plans fell to the ground in pieces. He had to forfeit his future and its plans. And notice that in the end, he had to stand starkly before the Lord. He could not stand before the Lord in some kind of a crown. He could not stand before the Lord with some kind of robe that has jewels fixed all over it. There he stood, absolutely stark, before the Lord. And in the end, he thwarted himself. No one else was to blame. It wasn't God. It was his own greed. Let's take a look at that. Then he said to them, Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed, for not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. It, notice that he thwarted himself. It wasn't God. It wasn't God who was taking all the joy out of life. It wasn't God who wanted to deprive him of every good thing of life. It wasn't God who wanted him to suffer. 
It basically was of his own doing, it was of his own value system, and his value system excluded God totally and completely. And notice that in the end, it was his greed. Then he said to them, Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed, for not everyone, when one has an abundance, does his life consist of his possessions. Notice what is most important here, what we have underlined. Every form of greed. Greed takes on many different faces. But in the end, it is always the same dynamic. It is always the craving of something or someone for one's own satisfaction. And that's all that it is. It comes in many forms. It has nothing to do with the real essence of life. And it's indicated that his own separation from God is due to his own grief. And because of that, let's take a look in closing. See what our own challenge is when it comes to this nature of greed and the consequences of it. We go to Romans 13, which basically is a reiteration of the law. For this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Notice that in our history, much of our understanding of human rights, more of natural light, rights come from this. That a man and a woman have the right for other people to respect their relationship and not have it in, messed up in any way. You shall not murder. Every man has the right to expect that his own well-being is secure from one's neighbor. That you shall not steal. The assumption in the law is that there are rights for every human being, but the assumption is that very few, if any, human beings will totally honor the rights of another. But rather, this you shall love your neighbor as yourself goes unattended. The consequences of greed, it is basically unbounded desire, it is arrogance, and it is an improper self-love. It is not wrong to have a proper love for yourself, but that is the important thing. It's proper. And so what shall we see? What shall we say? Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. This is the staggering thing to me, that greed is idolatry. And oftentimes, idolatry is unwarranted self-love. It's the worship of the creature rather than the creator. And it can indeed be self-worship, for this seems to be exactly what our rich farmer was doing. Paul says to Timothy, in the last times, the, the treacherous times are going to come because people will be treacherous, reckless, conceited. And notice, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. There is a proper order for love. And God should be at the top of the list. But instead, greed puts the self at the top of the list. And it is indeed a mark of unbelief. For this you know with certainty, that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of God. Notice that it is the mark of unbelief. It disqualifies a person from entrance into the kingdom of God. And so we want to take a look at what is really important. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added unto you. To me, this parable is very important for our times because we have done away with some of the values that would encourage a person to say, we live for something higher than ourselves. But instead, we should live for ourselves first and when we live for ourselves first, we are the only person in all of the universe that is of everlasting value. Everything else can be used up. And as long as we do not seek the kingdom of heaven and its righteousness, 
all of these other things that would be added to us by God's grace. We will selfishly cling after them, but they will never fulfill that vacancy that God has put in our hearts that can only be filled by him. And the question for you and for me and for all evangelical churches, when we read some of the social observations of our time, that much of the evangelical church is so much like secular society, you can't tell the difference. And so the question basically is this. Do we really seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, trusting in him that he will meet our needs for the time and for the circumstances? That's really what's at issue. And what really is most important, not only is it an issue for our own spiritual well-being, how will the spiritual well-being of other people be cared for if we do not have the capability to care for them? That is the question at hand. So let's be sure that each and every one of us here, we seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness and trusting in him that he will give to us that which we need because godliness with contentment, says Paul, is great gain. Our Father, as we come to you in prayer, we ask that you would cause us to know who we are, that you would cause us to look and see ourselves as you see us. May we know whether or not we are merely religious without having a true commitment to you through Jesus Christ. May we know that we have that true commitment to you through Christ. May we not be fooling or kidding ourselves in any way. And we ask above all else that you would renew us to a steadfast commitment to Christ Jesus, that people might see him for who he is, might embrace him for who he is and what he does. And may we be able to say, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I hope to see you there. In Christ's name we pray and ask these things. Amen.